to your congregation of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I'll begin this afternoon by listing some questions and answers from the Westminster Children's Catechism. Who made you? God. What else did God make? God made all things. Why did God make you and all things? For his own glory. How can you glorify God? By loving him and doing what he commands. Why ought you to glorify God? Because he made me and takes care of me. With these five questions, the Westminster Children's Catechism begins, and together these questions paint a clear picture of how humans ought to relate to God. The questions and answers are a great introduction for our little children to learn some of the foundational truths of who our God is and and who we are in relation to him. In fact, they lay out truths that even we as adults need to be reminded of. And yet as clear as help and helpful as these questions are, as we grow older, as we become more mature in our faith, we have questions that go a little deeper than this. We find ourselves looking for more answers. These questions are an excellent foundation, but we need a place to go for more answers about the, the great question of who God is and who we are as his people. Thankfully, the book of Genesis offers us the clearest insight into the questions of creation, into the questions of who we are as humanity, into the question of the nature of God, into the, the great question of the meaning of life. All of these answers are found in Genesis. This morning or this afternoon, we'll see how Genesis begins with God. In this magisterial first chapter, we not only encounter God, we behold the glory of and the goodness of God. As Moses recounts the origin of everything, he also reveals the glory and goodness of God, our creator. If, as the children's catechism teaches us, our life is indeed intertwined with God, then knowing what sort of God our God is, is essential. It's of paramount importance. Thankfully, the first chapter of Genesis reveals several aspects of our God's nature. It begins by revealing that we worship a God who brings order out of nothing. If you've grown up in the church, as many of us have, you may have never considered a God with a different nature than the God we worship. God is God. Like someone who's grown up in one particular place and never traveled anywhere else or experienced any other culture, you may assume that everywhere on earth lives the same way that you do. Of course, that isn't true. And so, too, if we've never really stopped and thought about it, we may think that God is just God. God is great. God is good. That's who God is. But when God inspired Moses to write Genesis, it was at a time when many other false so-called gods abounded. Genesis was the first book of the Bible. It was written in the days of Moses. That means that God's people had existed for many, many years already. And for its first readers, Genesis was not the first time that they had heard about God, but it was the first written word of God. And in their idolatrous context, in the surrounding nations who worshipped false gods, the book of Genesis was an amazing revelation. Consider by comparison the other gods that they would have heard about. The gods of Egypt were closely connected to parts of nature. The Nile River had a so-called god, as did the sun and moon. Even animals had been connected to gods or goddesses. So too in the theology of Mesopotamia, where Abraham was born. There too, the aspects of nature like the sea, the sun, the moon, were given divine authority, were connected to divine beings. And so it's in a clear contrast to the common religions of that day that God's revelation in Genesis displays a god who is beyond nature, in fact, beyond time itself. A God who wasn't just part of the world around us, but who is actually the source of the world around us. Even today, the first chapter of Genesis is life-changing. Although we don't encounter it as directly here in the West, there are many alternative gods and goddesses, so-called, worshipped around the world. And in light of both the variety of false gods and the personal stakes that each one of us bring to this question of needing to know who God is, 
who made us and defines us, the very first chapter of Genesis can hardly have a more practical message. Above everything else in life, who God is matters most. He's the eternal one. He's the source of all that we see. He's the creator. And Genesis 1 is our introduction to him. And with this in mind, the very first sentence takes on the deepest of meanings. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Behold our God. There was nothing before him. He is eternal. There's no origin story in the beginning of the Bible for God. God has always been. There's no pre-existent matter primed to explode. There's God. Neither is he attached to nature as the source of his being. No, God exists before everything. Instead, nature has its origin in him. In a world of false gods and alternative explanations for what we see around us, Genesis 1 verse 1 begins with majesty. In the beginning, God. But what sort of God is he? Verse 2 begins to reveal his nature. It gives us a glimpse into the earliest stages of creation. All things were made by God, and he made them by the power of his word. God had created the building blocks of the world, the yet formless earth and the unbounded sea, but he had much work to do. The earth, which was formless and empty, or was formless and empty, darkness was over the deep. And yet even in this picture of chaos and disorder, there's a hint of life and creation. For we're told that the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Our God was involving himself with his creation. And what a creation it would be. Suddenly God takes action. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. Already in these very first acts of creation, we see the nature of God shining through. He's a God who's eternal. He's a God of power. By his very word, he creates. But he's also a God who's interconnected with his creation. His spirit hovers over the waters. He's a God who brings order out of chaos. He comes to something formless and void, and he brings order to it. His work is good. Behold our God. During the next two days, God's work continues to demonstrate his goodness and glory. He brings order to the water, creates an atmosphere, dry ground, and by necessary consequence, he delineates the seas. He creates vegetative life of all sorts. In brevity, that doesn't hide the breathtaking beauty of what he's doing. God, through Moses, tells us of the earliest moments of our world. And of course, of the nature of the God who made it. Where other ancient mythologies tell of creation through conflict, perhaps even of wars of the gods that gave rise to earth and all of its chaos, the good news of Genesis is that this God, our God, is of a much different sort, a glorious God, a good God, a God we can truly worship. And that same theme continues as we witness God bringing life where there was emptiness. Though we may not have noticed it, over the first three days of creation, God has made several different realms that need filling. He's stretched out the sky, but as yet there's no heavenly lights. He's created an atmosphere, but it remains empty and silent. The sea, too, we're told, is barren. Only the dry land has a semblance of life in its leafy covering, but even that seems lifeless without creatures. It's a good beginning, but God's work is not done. In verses 14 to 19, God adds to his work by creating the lights in the sky, the sun, moon, and stars. These lights further God's intention of order. As God makes the sun, moon, and stars, he reveals his nature is to bring structure, order, and reason. These lights govern the day and night, but they also govern the seasons and the years. There's a subtle message here, too. You see, Genesis makes clear that these marvelous lights are God's handiwork. They serve for his glory, not so in the pagan mythology all around them. 
sun gods, moon gods, and the whole astrological arrangement from the pantheons of the pagans proclaimed these bodies of the heavens to be divine themselves. They thought of heavenly orbs as objects of worship, or perhaps as forces of destiny able to predict the future here on earth through alignments and eclipses. Genesis exposes such wisdom as folly, what foolishness to follow the astrological charts of the Babylonians, what folly to seek the favor of a sun god in Egypt. God made the lights of the sky. God made them not to rule creation, but to serve it, to give it light, to make it seasons. Even these great things bring glory to their creator. Having prepared the habitats for life, God begins to fill his creation. Imagine watching God at work here. Suddenly, where there was immense, deafening silence, there's life. The sea that was empty teems with creatures. The sky that was so silent is flooded with beautiful flocks of birds and flying creatures. Just as God's creation of the sun, moon, and stars exposed the folly of worshiping these bodies, these next acts of creation tell us the true origin of life. God spoke, and life began. There's no accidental process of random chance combined with near-infinite time. What a strange miracle that would be for a random chance to give rise to the beauty and structure and order that we see all around us. No, says Genesis. This beauty, this structure, this variety, they testify to the mind of God. He made it. He gave life. He gave beauty. He gave order. He gave structure. And it brings him glory. God's creation of the sea creatures is also a subtle attack aimed at the pagan myths of Moses' day. Many other ancient cultures worshipped the great sea creatures. But Moses is clear. God created them. In the mythologies, they were symbols of chaos and destruction, but for God, they're merely some creatures that he made. Their purpose was also to glorify God. Only the land remained without creaturely life, but on the sixth day, God began to feel that as well. God created animals, living creatures according to their kinds, livestock, creatures that moved along the ground, the wild animals, each according to its kind. This too was for God's glory. This, too, was good. Where once silence reigned, now vibrant life was all around. The sea, the sky, the land were teeming with new life. Every creature was unique. Every creature produced after its own kind. And each testified in its own way to the goodness and glory of the Creator. God's creation was almost finished. There remained one last piece, his crowning achievement. Verse 26 breaks the pattern and therefore draws our special attention. Suddenly God speaks to himself. Let us make man in our, own, in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him, male and female, he created them. That verse 26 doesn't, or it uses a plural, doesn't conclusively prove God's triune nature. It could have also been a plural of majesty or royalty. It could also have been a potential plural expressing the wealth of potential in the divine being. Linguistically, it doesn't demand that God is here revealing himself as a triune God. But as a later portions of scripture testify back to that truth, we can certainly and properly read God's triune nature into this sentence. That God made man in his own image is striking. Think of the other origins of man from the other mythologies of Moses' day. They thought that man was made as a sort of servant, perhaps even a slave to divine beings and divine wills. Genesis reveals that God bestows immense honor upon mankind. The term image is a very important one. It's been explained as personality, as nature, or as capacity for moral decision. Though the word can mean, can mean a physical representation of another being, 
God is spirit, and that makes our image bearing more than merely a physical thing. The entirety of human life is a reflection of God's spiritual nature. Both body and soul were in God's image. This means that we have spiritual life. We have ethical and moral sensitivities. We have a conscience. We have the capacity to represent our Creator. We immediately see this capacity in action as God speaks to man. God didn't speak to any other aspect of his creation, but to his image bearer, he speaks. And we learn. Hearing is part of our image bearing. God's speech to mankind reveals other aspects of image bearing. There's a calling to rule over creation, a way in which we bear the image of God. There's a calling to be fruitful and multiply. As part of bearing God's image, humanity is able to produce life. It's a mysterious thing to realize that a man and woman can produce a living, never-dying soul in their children. As the apex of God's creation, mankind receives a place of honor from God. Far from a slave or a source of entertainment, let alone a product of time or chance, mankind is the crown of creation, made in God's image honored and elevated by God, spoken to by God. They're made to honor and glorify the Creator. And with this last aspect of creation, God finishes his wonderful work. And so we see man as the apex of a fully formed and filled creation made by God for him. We see man and woman as glorious indeed. There they stood before the fall, vice regents of a creation in a state of spiritual, social, an ecological perfection. God had given every seed-bearing plant and fruit-bearing tree for food. They were at peace with God and with nature. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was the morning, the sixth day. It's an amazing picture, and it's full of the glory and goodness of God, but God's not totally finished Creation is done, but there's one more aspect that Genesis wants us to know. The final action of God in creation is to bring blessing. Chapter 2, verse 2 tells us, By the seventh day God had finished the work that he had been doing, so on the seventh day he rested from all his work. And God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. The verb for God's rest is very close to the Hebrew word for Sabbath. It's a word that means rest, but with a different emphasis than we often give it. The rest that our God took was not an act of rest that restores lost energy. The rest that we might take after a tiring week of work. Rather, the rest that God took describes the enjoyment of accomplishment, the celebration of completion. It's the sense that you get when you run your hand along a finished piece of fine woodworking, or the sense that you get when you've finished painting a room in your house and you walk back into the room before you go to bed just to see it one more time, or when you mow the lawn and you walk through the lawn afterwards and notice how uniform everything looks, or survey it from a window in your house. It's reflection, but it's also delight. It's that sort of rest. And it's that type of rest that the New Testament associates with the the Lord's Day. Not so much a day of relaxation and recovery, though though it will restore us, but it's a day of enjoyment of God's accomplishments in salvation. It's a day of celebration that God has set us free. And so God rested. He rested and he blessed the seventh day and made it holy. And that Genesis notes that God is resting is not merely a historical note describing what God did, although it's that. It's also a theological point, teaching us about who God is, teaching the Israelites the origin of their Sabbath rest. The Sabbath day was God's day. It was blessed by God. It was set apart by God. It was intended by God to be a blessing for his people. It was a day of rest and gladness. To read the creation account and then to suggest that the Sabbath day should be some sort of burden is to miss it. 
almost entirely. It's impossible to read it that way, if not downright disrespectful. Because God intended this day to be a delight to us. And that's how we should see it. Our rest is not legalism, the letter of the law, but neither is it self-centered relaxation. We've not honored the Lord's Day simply by the fact that we haven't done any work. No, it's a day to celebrate what God has done in all of his wonderful works, in making us, in sustaining us, in saving us, in promising to return us to himself. God has given us reasons, many reasons, to rest in his work on the Lord's day, even as we rest from our work. And so as we reach the end of the Genesis account of God's great work of creation, we can step back and we can look again at the God that it reveals in its big picture view. In its most boiled down form, this passage is a passage that reveals God's nature. It shows us his goodness, his majestic glory, as few other passages of God's word do. In Moses' day, as in ours, it spoke to God's people about the God that they were worshiping, a God with no beginning, who always was and is and will be, a God of immense power, who alone is authoritative, both by virtue of being the biggest and the strongest, but also because he's the creator and the life giver. A God of great wisdom who orchestrates the various elements of creation into a wonderful whole. A God of matchless creativity who makes beauty and order and structure out of nothing. A God whose work yields blessing. Blessing for mankind in paradise and blessing for God in a creation that is good, and very good. God's creation has been attacked and undermined in very, way, very many ways. But as we take a look at Genesis at its first chapter, consider the positive of what's here is recorded for us. Consider the glory and the goodness of our God. He creates, and it's very good. The following chapters of Genesis will describe how mankind fell into sin. How mankind plunged all, of, plunged all of God's creation into sin as well. We see the proof around us. We see it in sickness, in suffering, in sadness, in death, in destruction, in decay. We see it in our own hearts. We see it in the hearts of, and lives of those we love. We see it in the world, in the news headlines. But as we reflect on what God's work of creation must have been like here in what we sometimes call paradise, it gives us a wonderful picture of what God intends for his salvation to be. Today, the presence of sin's effects are all around us. We see them everywhere, in other people, in our own lives. At times, it might make us question God's plan, might make us hesitate to call God good. But consider, reflect on what his creation was. And as you see the goodness of what God made here in the beginning of Genesis, remember his promise for what creation will be. Dear people of God, our God was not content to let his creation be destroyed by sin forever. Instead, he gave the promise of an even greater miracle, the promise of a Messiah, the seed of the woman who would crush the head of the serpent, the Son of God. And just as God has formed the universe out of nothing for his glory, So too, his power to restore our broken lives is evident. Just as God's original work of creation displayed wisdom, beauty, organization, and fullness, life and abundance of it, so too, God's ability to recreate, to work salvation, is the same. We've seen God's power and plan to restore all things through Christ. Allow the goodness and glory of God in Genesis to encourage you to trust his promises for eternity, his promises of salvation by faith. Behold the glory and the goodness of the God we worship and rest in him. Amen.